Open up with me to Hebrews chapter 3. Going to be looking at verses 7 through 19 today. And if, if you don't know, you're about to know that City Soul Ministries goes live on the YouVersion Bible app every week. Um, if you don't have the YouVersion Bible app, you need to get it. All the cool kids have it. All the cool churches have it. You need to get it. It's there. It's an incredible resource for you. I read mine every day. You, know, you got your phone in your pocket every day. Um, but that, that app is incredible. So if you get that app out and down on the bottom, I believe it's the right-hand corner, you click on more, and then you click on events. And if you have your location services on, there are two churches in the area that go live. We are one of them. And you click on City Soul Ministries, and everything that you need is right there. The scripture, uh, you don't even need a physical bulletin anymore. Um, we're going to put our greeters' jobs in jeopardy since we're, it's all on there. Uh, sermon archives, and even a way to give your offering. It's really cool. Make sure and, and check that out. I want to start off by asking you today, do you have any fears in your life? Anything that you really fear? I'm talking about something that really, really gets you going. Some of you may say, yeah, you know, I have a, I have a fear of the future. You know, I'm, I'm scared to see my kids grow up in this, this crazy world. I'm, I'm fearful of that. Others of you may say, yeah, I have a big project coming up at work, and I'm very fearful about getting it done and doing it the right way. Other people have a, a fear of public speaking. Other people have a, a fear of heights. The list is, is really, really long. I actually have some fears that include but aren't limited to snakes. Man, this time of year, the sunshine coming out, I know that the snakes are going to be there in my backyard. So I'm always tiptoeing around the yard and like looking around the corners, but it never fails. Every summer, a snake uh, jumps out and attacks me in my backyard and it scares me to death. I have a fear of taking tests. I was never a good test taker in school. I always, you know, get to the test and I'm like, oh my goodness, I forgot everything that I learned. I always had a fear of tests. I have a fear of, a fear of heights. In fact, the list is very, very long for me of things I'm afraid of. And I don't want you to think any less of me as a person or as a man or as a pastor. So I'm just going to leave it at three. But the list is actually pretty long. You know, there are some fears in life that are very legitimate and really get to us at times. The scripture that we're going to study today is going to hopefully open our eyes to the reality of, of not being so stubborn in our ways, uh, not, of not missing the forgiveness that God wants to, uh, to offer us. We don't want to miss faith. We don't want to miss what Jesus has done for us. And there's a sense of, of understanding as we live our lives as Christians of, of being aware that, that one day we're going to stand before God. Every single person is going to stand before God and give an account of their lives. And, and what are you going to plead? What are you going to say? Well, I can tell you that I'm going to say the name of Jesus, that the blood of Jesus has washed me clean, given me the, the salvation that I've needed by, by faith in, in Jesus Christ. This passage that we're going to read and study today is a warning to all of us. It's a, a caution to the wise. So all my wise people in the room today, listen very carefully as we read this. So follow along. Starting in verse seven, it says, that is why the Holy Spirit says, today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. That's kind of the, the theme of this today. Don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them. And I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. If you want more on that particular passage right there, Psalm 95, 7 through 11. If I had time, I'd preach through that as well today. But Psalm 95, 7 through 11, read that as well. And then here is the warning. Here's the, the fear that we kind of need to be had instilled in us this morning. It's verse 12. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, here's the promise, don't miss it. Don't miss the promise that's given here. We will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did 
when they rebelled. I'm going to stop there today, Sound Booth guys. We're going to we're going to stop there, and uh, we're going to read uh, a little more later. But what we have uh, what we have read here and are talking about is the Israelites from the Old Testament. I don't know if you know the story, but God had delivered them um, from under slavery under Pharaoh. But after some time, as time had, had started to go on, the, the redeemed God's people that Moses led out of slavery, their hearts began to be hardened. They started to not trust God and doubt and fear and anxiety started to enter their minds. A hardened heart is useless. A person who is so bitter, so hateful, so angry, a hardened heart is really hard to restore. The Israelites were so convinced that God could not deliver them, that they simply lost their faith in God. They forgot that God had delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh. But as time went on, their hearts started to get hardened and they lost their faith. People with hardened hearts are so stubbornly set in their ways that they, that, they, that they won't turn to God. But this doesn't just happen suddenly or all at once. In fact, it's a series of choices to choose over and over again to disregard God's will, to, to have this hardened heart builds up over time. If someone will resist God long enough, God will turn them over to their sin. I've been serving in the ministry for 14 years, and I have seen it over and over again. People who receive Christ in their lives, they're excited about their faith. They want to do great things for Jesus. But after some time goes by, the temptation of this world sucks them back in. And before you know it, they're, they're back living in their old sin, back living in their old habits, back being defined by their sin, and have turned their backs upon the Lord. You'll see people come to church, and man, they're excited and they're enthusiastic, and they're attracted by the warmth of Christ in the local church. And they'll say nice things, but you turn away for just a moment, and then you, you turn back around, and they've disappeared back into the dark. The apostle Paul faced it with the Galatians in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you'd seen a picture of his death on the cross. Church, this is really a serious thing today if you stop and think about it. The fear of abandoning your faith. The fear of getting to a point where you wander back into the darkness. After receiving the light of Jesus into your life, the fear of turning your back on that. And, and how do you keep that enthusiasm burning? When you start with Christ, how do you finish with Christ? When you start with what Jesus has done for you, how do you keep the faith until the end? How do you keep your faith until you take your final breath upon this earth? Well, the warning and the answer is given to us today by the writer of Hebrews. And I wanna talk with you this morning, if you have your bulletin, if you have your Bible app out, I wanna talk with you today about some things that, that we can do to, to keep our hearts from hardening, to keep, our, uh, keep ourselves on the path that, that God has, has placed us to be on. So the question is, is, how do we keep that faith strong? How do we keep it going? Well, we're gonna talk about that in our notes today. The first thing that I want to talk to you about is serving. But I want to tell you today that as you're serving the Lord, I'm going to encourage you this morning to serve more. Number one today is serve more. There's an old line that says, don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today. Don't put off until tomorrow what you can do today. I love that line. And it's, it's kind of a ringing anthem in, in my life personally. But this statement is especially true in our faith. Never put off what God has called you to do until tomorrow. You know, it's always easier to be obedient now than it is to be obedient later. Does anybody in the room today snow ski? Anybody, anybody snow ski? There's like two people in the room. Come on, more people snow ski than that. Yeah, there's a bunch of people in the room. I went one time, one time, one time, and I will never go again. When my wife and I were, were just dating, um, we went, and uh, let me just say it wasn't a finer moment in Luke Easter's life to see me on skis. Now, I pride myself in being a pretty athletic guy. 
I grew up playing sports, played sports all through school, probably could have played in college, but got sick of it. And, you know, I thought that I could just um, hop on these skis and uh, it would just be like riding a bike to me. I'd go out there and I'd be tearing up the slopes and people would be like, man, you're incredible for the first time out here. Well, I get there and I get all geared up and ready to go out and into the snow and, you know, shuffling through the snow wasn't too bad. But the real struggle first came when I saw that ski lift or that porch swing looking thing that you have to try and get on to get to the top of the mountain. So I I watched some people, you know, shuffle over to this thing and they didn't have any trouble getting on the ski lift. And I thought, oh, I can do this. Well, I shuffle over and you make a long story short after repeatedly falling down. And finally, my, my, my wife, my girlfriend at the time had to help me get on the ski lift. I finally got on. And this ski lift takes me to the top of this mountain. I didn't even really think about it. I'm going to the top of the mountain. I can't even ski. So I get off at the top of the mountain, and I'm like a newborn baby deer, fresh out the womb, trying to stand up. That's what I'm like, getting off of this ski lift. And then that fear starts to set in. I'm like, this isn't a joke. I, I am on top of this mountain, and somehow I have got to get down to back where I need to be on, on level ground. Well, I stood there and I had a legitimate conversation with myself. Luke, can you do this? You know, you got yourself up here. And and the longer I stood there, the steeper and the scarier that hill began to look to me. I thought about it and I doubted myself for a very good reason, but I hesitated. I want to tell you it's always easier to be obedient now than it is to be later. See, when the Lord leads you to do something, I want to tell you you need to do it now. In this text, Moses was getting ready to lead God's children out of Egypt. And God had sent a number of of terribly irritating and painful plagues, convincing Pharaoh to let God's people go. At one point, God sent frogs, yes, frogs, all over that country. They were in every house and every bed, covering all the floors, filling the streets. And Moses comes to Pharaoh and he says, now, as soon as you're obedient to God and you let God's people go, these frogs that are everywhere will disappear. Pharaoh, when do you want them to disappear? What would you say? I'd be like, right now, I want them out of here now. Well, Pharaoh says, tomorrow. Was Pharaoh crazy? Did he like these frogs? Did he want them to just hang around for another day? No, he had just not yet learned that it's easier to be be obedient to God now than it is to be obedient to God later. This morning, if God has placed something in in your heart, God is, is prompting you to do something. It's always easier to be obedient now than it is to be obedient later. I don't know where God is probably prompting you this morning or nudging you in a direction, but I know that many times you'll be somewhere and You'll, you'll, you'll have this nudging of the spirit and it'll be like, you know, you need, to, you need to invite that person to church or you need to, you know, pay for their lunch and just be very nice to them. You know, different things where God is, is prompting you to do something. You're like, ah, you know, I'll, I'll share my faith with them tomorrow or, you know, I'll, I'll do something nice tomorrow. Maybe this morning God is really convicting you to stop a sin in your life, to repent of that sin, to turn from that sin. But yet today you're still like, I want to I wanna mess around with that sin a little bit more. It's easier to be obedient today than it will be tomorrow. Be confident and be obedient today to where God is calling you. And where I'm encouraging you this morning is to serve and to serve more. Number two, to keep our faith strong, we have got to protect our hearts. Number two today is we've got to protect our hearts. Your heart <clears throat> and my heart is the seed of emotions according to the Bible. Everything of importance starts in the heart, according to the scripture. Therefore, begin by guarding what you allow into your heart. Almost all sin is premeditated. Very little in life sneaks up on us and makes us perform. However, our human nature is, is we like to blame our circumstances. We like to blame our spouse. We like to blame our background. We like to blame our circumstances for why that sin is in our lives. But the truth is, is sin always begins in our hearts and we premeditate it. Well, the question becomes, how do I protect my heart? What are you talking about? Protecting my heart? You protect it by guarding what you allow into your life. Let me give you some examples. What you watch the movies you watch, the things that you watch on Netflix, 
the things that you allow into your mind and into your heart, the things that you listen to, the people that you associate with. You get what I'm saying? You hang around with the the rowdy crowd before long, you're going to probably get a little rowdy too. You find gossip tasty, stay away from social media. Stay away from those people who like to spread the gossip. The problem is, is we like to just act like our sin came out of nowhere, that it just fell out of the sky and knocked us upside the head. Affairs, for example, they don't start in the bedroom. They don't start in the backseat of a car. They start with a little bit of flirting and it progresses from there. It may be a a year process. It may be a two-year. It may be a six-month process of investing in someone emotionally that is not your spouse. You don't just trip and fall into bed with somebody else that isn't your spouse. Church, we just want to think at times that, oh my goodness, my sin just happened. I just tripped and, oh, I just fell into the sin. Or that falling away from Christ, you know, it just doesn't happen that quick. It begins in the heart. Sin can be described this way. It's a process. We see it. We see it. We desire it. We then think about it. And then we possess it. We step across that line and we sin. We see it. We desire it. We think about it. And we possess it. What we need to do is we need to start at the beginning of that process by ridding the sin in our lives, repenting of our sin, trusting that God can can reveal to us where we need to turn from sin. And this is going to keep our faith going. This is going to keep us strong. This is going to keep us going until the end because there's so many things in this world that are threatening to pull you away from the love of Jesus. There's so many things that are threatening to take you away from the love that your heavenly father wants to give you. Number two today is guard your heart. Number three, this one's gonna be painfully obvious, but it's gonna be saying to you under number three that you've gotta know the word of God. You've gotta know the word of God in your life. If you are 100% honest with yourself and 100% honest with God right now, and you should be, you're in church. The question is, is when was the last time that you studied God's word? When was the last time that you had a good study in God's word? Now, I would assume, and I'm not just gonna pick on this church, but I'm gonna say that most churches around the world this morning, most people in those churches have not cracked open their Bibles at all this week. Nothing is as costly as ignorance. Nothing is as costly as ignorance. Friends, if there really is a God of this universe, if there really is an author of life, a giver of life, you know, a God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die into this world, then it is absolutely crucial that every single one of us find out as much as we can about the owner, about the creator, about the author of life. It's everything to us to know his heart, to know who he is. And where we find that knowledge is in his word. You know, my, my dream for the church is simply this. People who are hungry for the word of God, people who are hungry for more of God and, and less of them, that this is what defines us as a church is our hunger for God's word. Not that we're defined by our jobs, not that we're defined by how we look, not by we're defined by how much money we have, but we are hungry for more of God and less of us. How are you gonna know the purpose that God has for your life if you're not in his word? How are you gonna know God's heartbeat if you're not reading his spoken word to you? I say this so much but Sunday morning is not even close to being enough in God's word. What it really boils down to is making the time and approaching the word of God with the right attitude. So many of us will come to the word of God with our minds already made up that I'm not gonna get anything out of this. I don't understand all of these words and all these names. If that's your attitude, then you're right. You're not gonna get anything out of it. Get yourself a good study Bible that's gonna help you understand the context, that's gonna help you understand the setting, that's gonna give you some background information. Buy yourself a commentary, a commentary that's gonna give you what the scripture means. Understanding the word of God is the most important thing in your life. You keep that fire going. You keep that ability to not turn your back on your heavenly father 
by knowing who he is, by studying his word. And the truth is in most churches today, Bible study ain't happening. Bible study ain't happening with our kids at home. Bible study isn't happening with our spouse. Bible study isn't happening on our personal time. We come to church and we think that's enough. And it's great that you're here. You need to be here. Don't you know, forsake this gathering together as the scripture tells us. But understand that you have got to be in the word of God yourself. Next, I wanna to talk, to 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 talk to you about your motives. I wanna to talk to you about why you do what you do. Number four is, is our motives. Last week, man, we hit it hard in Matthew 6 uh, with a message that, that really left a lot of us challenged. And uh, Jesus teaching about giving to the needy and, and why giving to the needy and giving to anyone is, is important, but there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And what it's all about is it's about our motives. Why do I give? Do I give to receive the praise? Do I give just to say, look at, what, look at me, I'm, I'm this great Christian, I'm the super Christian, I gave? Or do you give with the expectations of you may not see the blessings until you get to heaven. You may not see the results of your giving until you get to heaven, but know that your motives matter. Each weekend here at this church, it takes a lot of people to keep this church going, you know, each and every single week to have two services and a midweek service on Wednesday. Now that we have two services going for over a year now, it takes a lot more volunteers, you know, people to come in and clean the church, people who are out there and, and shake your hands, people who make the breakfast each week, people who are downstairs right now working with our kids, the band who comes in and puts in hours of practice to, to make the worship experience the best it can be. And why do people do this? Why do they do it week after week to build God's church? Did they ask to be recognized, to be patted on the back in front of the church? No, they do it out of service to the Lord for their love for the Lord. Ask those people if they ever get tired. Ask them if they do, and I guarantee they'll say, yeah, we get tired. Yeah, we get tired coming in here week after week. Sure, they get tired. Sure, I get tired but we are doing it for one lone reason. We are doing it for one reason, to bring honor to God's name. This morning, what are your motives? Why do you do what you do? Why are you sitting in that seat this morning? Why did you give your offering just a little bit ago? Why are you signing up to volunteer at this church? Why are you going out into this community and doing what you're doing? Are they pure? Are your motives pure or are they self-seeking. If you see that your motives are not pure, let me tell you, you don't need to be doing what you're doing. If you're doing it because you feel like you have to, if you're doing it with a lousy attitude, or you're doing it with the expectation of, I want people to see me doing this, then you're better off not to do it. To keep the fire going, stop sometimes, and allow God to, to purge your heart to show you and to reveal to you areas where your heart is, is, is not where it needs to be, where your heart is, is in its motives. And let him give you not only the right actions, but the right reasons for those actions, the reasons why you're doing what you're doing. It is so incredibly important, important to do things, but to understand you gotta do them with the right motives. Lastly today, how we keep our faith going strong is, I just wanna simply say to you under, under number five, is we've gotta be real, is we've gotta be real with what we know. Listen to me very, very carefully under this final point today, is the world promises to give you happiness and the things that it offers. And every single one of us in this room have bought into that lie. But here's the truth. Here's the, 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 the reality of that, of that lie. It never delivers. The world's promises of making you happy never delivers. Realistically, sin never delivers on its promises. Although sin may feel good for a while, it may give you a high for a while, it may bring you pleasure for a season. It leads to sure and certain destruction. And this is a word directly from the God who created us. The change that Christ has made in your life should be evident. It should be crystal clear not only to you, but to the people around you. You ever had somebody say to you before, what's different about you? you know, not that you're weird or creepy, but what's, what's different about you? What's, what's up with all this love that you've got to offer? This forgiveness, this grace. 
That's the spirit of the living God living inside of you. You know, the fruits of God's spirit becoming real in your life. But the warning that we've looked at today in Hebrews should keep us all grounded. It should remind you today of how important it is to keep the faith. See, the Israelites that we're talking about in the scripture today, they failed to enter the promised land because they did not believe and trust in God's protection. They did not believe that God would help them conquer the giants in the land. So God sends them in the desert to wander for 40 years. This was such an unhappy alternative to the wonderful, beautiful gift that God had in store for them, but they lost their faith. They lost their trust and they missed out on the blessing that God had in store for them. Lack of trust in God always prevents us from receiving his best. Our lack of trust in God always prevents us from receiving his best. Here at City Soul, we want his best. We want to serve the Lord with everything that we have, and we want to do it with the right motives. We trust him with everything, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially. Everything that we have is because of him. Everything that I have is because of him. Can you say that today? Your faith is the most precious thing in your life. And every single day, you need to be building it up, trusting the way of God, and know that one day, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you will be rewarded. You will enter into that rest that the scripture was talking about today. That rest where you see your heavenly father face to face. And because of your faith in Jesus Christ, nothing that you've ever done, but your faith in Jesus Christ, you enter into that rest for eternity. But I'm also here to tell you today that there's rest that God wants to offer you this morning. First of all, the rest of knowing that your soul is saved by confessing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Then having the rest of, you know, resting each week, you know, resting every single day, resting in Christ, resting in the promises of God's word, receiving the rest that you need that your heavenly father wants to give you today.